Hello and welcome to this presentation session. My name is Wayne Bridger and I'm the Head of Applied Technology at BOC based in the UK. I've worked in the industrial gases industry for approaching 30 years and in this webinar session I would like to share my views and experience on two aspects which relate to my area of expertise. Firstly, in the role of hydrogen for future steel making, and secondly, the additional pathways towards sustainable steel production use, utilizing oxygen-based technologies. From a personal point of view, for the past three years, I've been almost entirely focused on industrial decarbonization projects, and during that time, I've led the BOC mobilization of large-scale industrial fuel switching trials using hydrogen as a substitute fuel in process trials for energy intense primary industries including cement, lime, glass and the consumer goods sector. Just by, by way of briefly orienting you to our organization, I would like to explain that BOC are a Linda company and throughout this session, I will talk about BOC and Linda interchangeably. We are one organisation. BOC are the leading industrial gases manufacturer in the UK and Ireland, and we've been established here for approaching 140 years. Similarly, Linda are a leading industrial gases and engineering company with a very significant global scale, both in respect of industrial gas production and engineering but also in steel making technology areas. For example, Linda were the originators of both Cojet and AOD technologies, amongst others, and we believe we have a long and proud association with the steel making industry. Equally importantly in this current era, our expertise in the field of hydrogen, where we've been producing, distributing, storing and developing hydrogen based process applications on a very large scale, and this provides us with valuable capability and expertise and we'd like to use that capability to help steelmakers transition to a low carbon future. I often remind people that I engage with across industry that whilst hydrogen is new to many, it's not new to BOC and Linda, that we've been doing hydrogen for decades. So the road towards large scale low carbon hydrogen, whether CCUS enabled or electrolytic in our view, remains long and we think that the hydrogen we think that hydrogen is the end game in this process rather than the start we know the uk government aspire to achieve 10 gigawatts of low carbon hydrogen by 2030 but how much of that is currently built and what will be commissioned by 2030 the point when many industrial organizations have indicated they want to have made meaningful decarbonization steps by so if we do agree that hydrogen is the end game and there is a strong desire to deliver measurable decarbonisation now, then we believe that industry should be focused on oxygen as an equally important decarbonisation gas. And I would like to come back to that thought shortly. Going back to the question of hydrogen availability, to put this into some sort of context, if you consider the overall requirement for hydrogen just to decarbonise steel making, then the current production capacity for hydrogen globally would need to double. If you applied that to green hydrogen, then it's a 200-fold increase. So it's easy to conclude that the imbalance between anticipated demand and supply is likely to be a major short-term rate-limiting factor for the decarbonisation of steelmaking. Also, the question of blue or green hydrogen Clearly, large-scale blue hydrogen has the challenge of carbon capture, although you may have noticed the recent UK government announcement on cluster sequence in Phase 2, the project shortlist which included the BOC T-side hydrogen CCUS project, which hopefully gives us an early lead on UK blue hydrogen production at scale. We see the production of blue hydrogen playing a pivotal role in the foreseeable supply mix for hydrogen and we believe that's important because it provides a relatively easy and existing technology step to employ carbon capture and blue provides predictable output 
which isn't reliant on achieving ideal weather conditions to drive wind turbines, and it's a scalable technology platform. So I believe blue hydrogen will act as the supply balance technology until there's sufficient low carbon or renewable energy to support high capacity electrolysis. So hydrogen is challenging on a number of fronts. Technically, it's not easy and requires major steel making process change. It's very costly and the question of how that investment is delivered remains uncertain. And depending on the life expectancy of existing assets, there may be a long period before sustained change is implemented. But if we're to achieve meaningful carbon reductions before 2030, as many have suggested they wish to deliver, then time is short and actions are needed now. And for this to succeed, it needs intense collaboration between steel plant operators, government, suppliers, and the investment community. And I question whether that collaboration is effective in delivering progress just yet. So as I've just highlighted, the full decarbonisation of the steel industry requires a huge global surge in hydrogen production capacity. And that will take considerable time and significant investment to deliver. But the current lack of hydrogen capacity isn't the only challenge to resolve. It is well understood that the hydrogen DRI EAF process route may offer a near commercially viable decarbonized steel making process. However, aside from the availability of hydrogen in sufficient scale, there are other challenges to this approach. We estimate that the additional capex required for DRI EAF is likely to be in the range of about $1,000 per tonne of capacity and rising. And then if you add in the upstream capex for green power, that adds around a further $4,000 a tonne of capacity. So the scale of future capital investment to support hydrogen steel making is incredible. And it's understandable that producers are reluctant to release capital for fear of a regretful investment decision, but this can only lead to further inertia. Everyone is aware of the current crisis affecting energy suppliers and operating costs are a challenge and that's likely to endure for the foreseeable. And th these cost challenges also flow through to the future generation of green hydrogen. We estimate that power costs alone account for around 60% of the total cost per unit of green hydrogen gas. Other challenges include the further investment required to increase the supply of DR pellets, also, if basic iron and steel making processes change, does that adversely affect the balance of upstream and downstream processing facilities and therefore require further substantial reconfiguration? And it goes without saying that steel makers want to be able to sweat and maximise the life of existing capital assets. So the timing of implementation of significant change is going to be driven in part by this timeline. Presumably, as blast furnace relining requires become necessary. So when you add all of that together, we appear to have a series of significant challenges which stand between us and a sustainable steel making future. So if all of these challenges require long-term thinking and investment, my question is, how do we begin to decarbonize in the near term? Is it right to wait to decarbonize the process from top down or should we begin working on the addressable issues now? And before we move on to what are the addressable steps now, just a quick word on hydrogen economics, particularly for combustion processes. It's also worth considering that the lowest anticipated future cost for hydrogen is forecast to be around $2 a kilo, which is the equivalent to around $15 a gigajoule. So it's going to be an expensive fuel in the foreseeable future. So we at BOC believe that the fuel efficiency measures and oxy-fuel combustion of hydrogen will be an economic necessity as we move forward towards full decarbonisation. So what could a sustainable strategy for steel making look like? Firstly, let's acknowledge the enormous challenge presented by the cost of decarbonisation. The decarbonisation of the BOF steel making process has to happen and this is simply a question of survival. And it's clear that the decarbonisation strategies 
have emerged from many steel producers, but there is a big question of who pays, and this still remains. My concern here is that the UK government's Clean Steel Fund is widely anticipated for launch in 2023, but there is a significant anticipated funding gap. And if this remains unresolved, then the risk of inertia remains in the delivery of decarbonisation. At BOC and Linda, we are strong advocates of a different perspective and approach. And this is about seeing the approach to these challenges from a different point of view. While steel producers understandably feel they have to wait to see if agreement about how to resolve the billion dollar capex question can be achieved, and this will drive technology choices in future, very limited progress towards decarbonisation is currently being achieved. So our position is this. Decarbonisation is not only about the big questions of hydrogen steel making, and I would ask you to consider that decarbonisation is equally based on oxygen technologies. And in a decarbonised future, fuel efficiency will be as important as the fuel itself. So we would, like, we would strongly advocate to steelmakers that they begin to act now and address the available bottom-up opportunities that exist. These are typically addressable with existing and well-proven oxygen-based technologies. And in the end, these processes will need to be converted to meet the full decarbonisation challenge of steelmaking anyway. So these decisions can't be regretted in future. Our view is that step one of a sensible, sustainable steelmaking strategy starts now and it starts with its focus on fuel efficiency. This is arguably highly relevant in the current climate of exceptionally high energy costs, as it will be in a hydrogen fuel future. We believe significant fuel savings are achievable through the wider application of oxy-fuel combustion technologies. Our view of step two also acts to help address the high cost of imported energy. We think that the we think that oxy-fuel combustion technologies can also help in the full utilisation of lower calorific site arising gases and I would particularly highlight the potential for the use of Linda's novel hot oxygen gasification technology which could be utilised in the gasification of a wide range of waste materials and the resulting syngas could be utilised in existing blast furnaces, DRI and reheat furnaces. Further along the pathway towards decarbonisation, we see step three, and this obviously depends on geography, but where carbon capture technologies need to be employed, then the ideal scenario for carbon capture conditions are low flue gas volumes and a rich CO2 content. Therefore, oxy-fuel combustion does lend itself to achieving this, and the consequence of this is to enable the scale down of systems to minimise capex and opex elements to the lowest possible level. And then the final step is to hydrogen. At some distance into the future, and when all other relatively low cost and well proven steps have been undertaken, the shift from fossil fuel to hydrogen processing can be achieved. And despite the challenges ahead, the significant scale up in capacity will begin to reduce the unit cost of hydrogen production. But my message today is that until this becomes a reality, then the focus of your decarbonisation efforts and investment should be applied elsewhere. Considering other novel means to utilise low carbon feedstocks for gasification to low carbon fuels, I'd like to draw your attention to Linda's novel hot oxygen technology, which I briefly mentioned earlier, and which is a new technique for gasifying and reforming a wide range of solid wastes, organic materials, plastics, pie oil, and coke oven gas to produce a rich syngas stream up to 35,000 normal meters cubed per hour per unit. This process has already been commissioned into commercial use and I see the opportunity to use it in two possible modes. One, 
This could be used in a conventional blast furnace operation to maximise injectant levels and to replace some coke. And this helps maximise blast furnace decarbonisation and utilisation of existing assets, which may be an attractive feature. And it achieves CO2 savings without a significant cost penalty. As an alternative, this could be used as a substitute for hydrogen in DRI. This has obvious potential economic and availability advantages over hydrogen and has the added benefit of providing a carbon source for DRI. So building on my theme of decarbonisation from the bottom up and starting the decarbonisation journey by focusing attention on fuel saving, and because these inter interventions can be delivered now and offer no regret capex utilisation, I'd like to briefly mention a couple of well-established technologies that are now hydrogen ready. Linda's CoJet technology, which has been established for almost 30 years and is installed in hundreds of steel plants around the globe and is still delivering all of the efficiency benefits of oxygen injection. This technology is now hydrogen ready. And as a result of our in-house trials, we've demonstrated that hydrogen actually is the best fuel for CoJet and it produces the longest jets compared to other conventional fuels. We've also demonstrated significant fuel savings in reheating operations at steel plants around the world. Conventional rebox installations deliver significantly lower fuel consumption, CO2 emissions and lower NOx emissions and looking forward, the combination of oxyhydrogen firing offers the potential to use this well-established technology to fully decarbonize the reheat process. This has been demonstrated successfully recently at the Avarco plant in Sweden, where we used Linda flameless oxyfuel te technology and hydrogen as a fuel to produce fossil-free heating. This will lead to a permanent decarbonisation of these soaking pits and a full installation is planned for 2023 across 24 pits which will save an estimated 20,000 tonnes of CO2 annually. So real deep decarbonisation can be achieved economically and in the short term. The last of these brief examples is Linda's Oxygon Ladle Preheating System which has significant fuel saving potential and therefore reduced CO2 emissions. The system is well known for its fast heating cycle and high preheat temperatures, which allows for the possibility of reduced tap temperatures and the associated energy savings. Again, this technology has already been adapted to operate on hydrogen and other low carbon fuel mixtures and so contributes to the theme to do everything you can now and take advantage of the easy wins. All of these examples have the potential for both energy and carbon savings and are well proven and risk free. If full decarbonisation of steel making is to be delivered, then these downstream activities will need to be addressed at some point anyway. So why not take advantage of them now? Hopefully, I've made the case that hydrogen is a critical part of the future steelmaking landscape. But the journey towards full hydrogen capacity is going to be long and complex, and it should be viewed as the end game, not the start of the journey. The capital funding decisions that are required to set Sustainable steel making plans into action are a hurdle that has to be cleared quickly if it's not to prolong the inertia that I believe we're seeing today. And I've attempted to set out a sustainable roadmap which highlights that there are many other complementary oxygen based technologies that exist and can be implemented now in order to create a fuel and energy efficient foundation for a future hydrogen steel making scenario. It's a high cost fuel, so it makes sense to work on fuel efficiency. 
these existing oxygen-based technologies address decarbonisation in areas that will need to be addressed on the journey to net zero. So if they offer the advantage of reduced energy and reduced carbon now, there's little risk and you're on the way to achieving a no regrets decarbonisation pathway.